The next item of business is a statement by Hamza Youssef on protecting those most at risk COVID-19 vaccination programme winter 2022. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Hamza Youssef, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome this opportunity to provide an update to the Chamber on the Winter Vaccination Programme for 2022. Vaccinations for the most vulnerable this winter started on Monday, so this week marks another key milestone in our continued effort to protect against COVID-19 and provide re resilience for the NHS this winter. As a nation, we have faced enormous challenges since the start of the pandemic. The challenges that stretch beyond the initial and serious health impacts of the virus. However, I think it's important to recognise just how far we have also come. For many of us, though I absolutely accept not all of us, uh, life feels uh, like it has largely returned to normal. We've lifted all legal restrictions and protective measures. This is only possible because of the game-changing COVID-19 vaccination and high levels of uptake amongst the Scottish public who have come forward to receive it and the uh, army of uh, vaccinators up and down this country to which I think we are all uh, eternally grateful to. Uh, more than 12 million COVID-19 vaccine doses have now been administered in Scotland. In fact, we have amongst the highest rates of COVID-19 vaccination uptake of first, second and third doses anywhere in the UK. At one point during our last winter vaccination programme, we had one of the fastest vaccination rollouts in the entire world. A fantastic achievement and protecting the most vulnerable in our society against serious illness and, of course, death. The European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control estimates that Scotland's vaccination programme has averted around 28,000 deaths amongst those aged 60 and over. We have an estimated total reduction of 86% in fatalities due to the vaccine, the highest percentage in Europe after Iceland. Every single one of those saved lives is someone's family member, it is someone's friend. And so it cannot be stated enough that our health service and everyone involved in the vaccination programme are owed by all of us a huge debt of gratitude. This autumn and winter, we will build on the success of previous programmes, uh, including, of course, the spring-summer programme, which has just drawn to a close. Like previous rounds of the vaccination, Scotland's spring booster programme enjoyed tremendous uptake as of the 5th of September, 70% of those with suppressed immune systems, 86% of the elderly uh, in care homes, 92% uh, of those aged 75 have received uh, that uh, spring booster dose. This represents 87% of all of those who are eligible for a fourth dose, which has exceeded our uh, expectations and planning assumptions. I'd like to express my sincere thanks to all those who came forward and again to those who have made that immense effort possible. Advancing our continued offer of vaccines and boosters will ensure as much protect protection as possible to those who are most at risk. So today we are publishing the deployment plan for the winter 2022 vaccination programme, uh, which sets out the detail of how we'll administer vaccines to those who are in most need here in Scotland. Well, this year's deployment plan still has at its heart the aim of tackling COVID-19. It recognises there are other challenges that put pressure on the NHS and endanger the health of some of our most vulnerable members of society. A key risk as we move into the winter is, of course, seasonal flu. And as Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care, I'm acutely aware of the pressures flu and COVID combined can weigh on, weigh, uh, on both the NHS and, of course, on people's personal health too. That's why I'm pleased we will offer, where possible, both the COVID-19 and flu vaccine in the same appointment to those who are eligible. As part of our approach to tackling winter pressures head on, we're aiming to vaccinate as many people against flu and COVID as possible by the beginning of December, while ensuring we have the necessary capacity in the system to achieve this. I'm all too aware of the strain the NHS is under, and in order to achieve the pace we need, we may need to accept there may well be some overlaps uh, of cohorts receiving their vaccines, and there may well be some small, and I hope limited, geographical variation, uh, as we don't want to hold any one area back, particularly later on uh, in the programme. This won't be unique uh, to Scotland, I suspect, but against this challenging backdrop, the goal remains to vaccinate those most vulnerable uh, as soon as possible. 
As ever, our decisions on who to vaccinate and when are guided by the clinical expertise of those in the Joint Committee of Vaccinations and Immunisation. In line with the Committee's recommendations this winter, a COVID-19 booster will be offered to residents and staff in care homes for older adults, frontline health and social care workers, all adults aged 50 and over, those aged 5 to 49 who are at clinical risk groups, including those who are pregnant, uh, those aged 5 to 49 who are household contacts of people with immunosuppression and carers aged 16 to 49. Everyone eligible for a COVID-19 vaccination will also be invited for a flu vaccine and can safely receive both vaccines at the same appointment. That's why this winter, uh, as I've already mentioned, we'll aim to administer the COVID-19 and flu vaccine at the same time where possible. This will save time, it will avoid the need for repeat journeys to vaccination centres and hopefully it will protect as many people as possible against the serious health risks posed by both COVID-19 and of course by uh, seasonal flu. The final point is particularly important. As we know, this year seasonal flu, seasonal flu arrived much earlier than expected uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. In addition to those eligible for a COVID-19 winter vaccination, the deployment plan sets out a range of other groups who will be offered the flu vaccine. Prioritizing, prior, prioritizing those most at risk it has been our approach from day one in accordance with the advice from JCVI. The winter vaccination program started Monday with care home residents. Many care home staff are being offered their vaccine at the same time, or of course, alternatively, they can book their appointment through the online portal along with health and social care workers, which has been open, that portal has been open since the 22nd uh, of August. Alongside care home residents and staff, uh, health and social care workers and individuals who are housebound are being vaccinated from Monday too, ensuring we protect, uh, as I say, the most vulnerable first. We've already scheduled more than 800,000 winter vaccination appointments for those aged 65 and over, with hundreds of thousands more being scheduled in the course of this week. So I'd urge all of those who are eligible uh, to please wait uh, until you've been contacted. Uh, anyone who's any, in, in any doubt at all about if they'll receive an appointment should visit the NHS Inform website for more information. Given the immunity conferred by vaccination, it can wane over time it's important we maximise protection for the most vulnerable ahead of winter when the threat from COVID-19 and flu is likely to be at its greatest. By prioritising those most at risk, we can also limit strain on our NHS as it recovers from the worst effects of the pandemic. Uh, on the 15th of August and 3rd of September, uh, the MHRA um, granted regular, regularity approval to two updated bivalent vaccines, uh, so-called because of their dual aspect, which targets both the original strain of COVID uh, and uh, the Omicron variant too. Bivalent vaccines have been deployed as part of our winter vaccination program from the, from the start of this week. The vaccine use will depend upon clinical el eligibility, but also crucially on vaccine availability. However, I want to reassure the public that both the existing and the new bivalent vaccine provide excellent protection from severe illness and hospitalization. And I would urge all of those eligible to take up the offer of the vaccination whenever they are called forward. The vaccination program is a vital step in our plans to address as many of the winter pressures as possible. We're also well aware of the bigger picture. We cannot fail to acknowledge uh, the cost of living crisis and all that entails, the potential we know for industrial action, although, of course, we'll work hard uh, to ensure that does not happen. Uh, inevitable bad winter weather. Uh, all of these issues, plus more, may well make it difficult to travel to large-scale vaccination centres than previously. And, of course, the fact that uh, restrictions have been lifted, uh, legal restrictions, certainly means that those large-scale venues are, quite understandably and quite rightly, going back to their original purpose. Uh, for this reason, for those reasons, we are instead offering smaller local clinics to facilitate access to those who need it most. With over 440 clinics available across Scotland during this programme as of the 6th of September. We're also taking steps to ensure people who may experience barriers or feel less confident are able to come forward for vaccination. And while we have a general level of assurance in vaccine supply and delivery, this may of course be impacted by extreme adverse weather or disruption to transport routes and we'll do all we can to overcome 
those challenges. In conclusion, uh, Presiding Officer, this year's vaccination, winter vaccination programme will, uh, without any doubt, uh, confront uh, serious uh, challenges. Will, uh, our, our NHS is still in the midst of a, a period of recovery and sustained and significant challenge as we work towards ambitious targets and bring it down the backlog left by the COVID-19 pandemic. Nevertheless, I'm very confident the programme will be delivered in line with current JCVI planning, with the most vulnerable being vaccinated by the beginning of December, and will, like previous rounds of vaccination, achieve a high rate of uptake. Uh, if I may, Presiding Officer, I'd like to say to this Parliament and the public again, these vaccines provide excellent protection from severe illness, illness which could otherwise strike at the very worst time of the year. And I strongly encourage everybody who's eligible to take up the offer of the vaccination. I look forward to providing a further update, of course, to Parliament, detailing our progression through the programme in the coming months. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we'll move on to the next item of business. And I'd be grateful if members who wish to ask a question were to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call Sandesh Gilhani. Thank you. I welcome the rollout of the winter flu and COVID vaccination programme. This is the first bivalent vaccine targeting both the Omicron and original strain of COVID-19. As seen throughout the pandemic, working together as the United Kingdom, we're able to swiftly get jabs into arms. And early procurement of this bivalent vaccine is only possible because of the broad shoulders of our United Kingdom. And as a GP, I urge everyone who is eligible to please get vaccinated, as it will save your life. Cabinet Secretary, with the best will in the world, some people will not receive the letter through error. And some eligible people, for example, uncaid parents, may also not be lettered through not being known about. How does somebody who feels they are eligible but do not receive a letter book an appointment? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can, can I thank uh, Dr Gohani for uh, his comments and, and reiterate them around if you're eligible, please do uh, come forward. Uh, can I also say there is good Four Nations uh, working, uh, I have to say, although uh, obviously um, uh, I haven't uh, had the opportunity to meet the new Health Secretary, but I'm certain that will continue uh, uh, with her, and her new position. Uh, in terms of those who are eligible, um, various different cohorts will be contacted sometimes uh, differently, uh, depending uh, on the local uh, structure. So, for example, uh, the way of contacting, uh, for example, those uh, who are household contacts of those with immunosuppression might be different in Orkney than they will be, for example, uh, in, in Glasgow. But if you have any doubt whatsoever about your eligibility, uh, we can, of course, uh, direct people towards NHS Inform. If they are digitally excluded or unsure, they can also call the vaccination helpline for confirmation about whether they are eligible uh, or not and how they will be invited. But I would say also to, to Dr Gohani, and he's of course very aware of this, um, that, uh, that uh, this is uh, our second winter vaccination programme. Uh, this for many people uh, may well be their fifth dose of the vaccine. Uh, so I suspect people now are in the rhythm of knowing uh, whether they are eligible or not. Some may not be. Uh, and therefore, if there's any doubt, you have any doubt whatsoever, do not hesitate to call the vaccination helpline uh, for further information. Jackie Bailey. Presiding officer, let me in advance thank those who will be involved in running the winter vaccination programme. Um, we are very grateful for all of their efforts. But we know that the COVID vaccine lessens the impact of COVID, but we also know that it doesn't stop people from getting COVID in the first place. And that remains a significant concern for those who have underlying health conditions who were originally on the shielding list and told to stay at home. Not all of them are eligible for antiviral medication, and we have yet to see the use of prophylactics to prevent those most at risk from getting COVID in the first place. So can the Cabinet Secretary tell us when he will extend eligibility for antivirals to all those who are on the shielding list, and when will access to prophylactics be given so we can protect the very vulnerable from actually getting COVID in the first place? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, for, first of all, uh, if I may, I forgot to say in my response to Dr Gohani that I am writing out, or should have landed actually in most MSPs' inbox, uh, an update on 
uh, the, the winter vaccination programme. That will include uh, details of who is eligible and, and, and is a, much of a leadership role. Certainly, I have uh, my role as Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care. Uh, of course, uh, I, will I will hope that all MSPs will cascade that information locally. Uh, if they hear of any uh, individuals who have any doubt about whether they uh, are eligible or, or, or they think they are eligible but not getting uh, uh, any further information, then they are more, uh, more than happy for them to contact me uh, too. Uh, I would say to, to, to Jackie Bailey, I recognise uh, what she says. I recognise that there are people out there uh, who may not be suitable for whatever clinical reason to get a vaccine, although the vaccine does remain, of course, the best protection against uh, the serious effects uh, of, of COVID. Um, there will be some people who may just not uh, be able to, 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 to exhibit immune response uh, uh, due, uh, due to whatever clinical condition uh, they have. Uh, in terms of widening the access to antivirals, uh, that is a clinical discussion that is very much taking place. I've been contacted by the likes of, for example, uh, Parkinson's since UK, who I know are very keen for the, uh, their members, those they represent with Parkinson's, uh, to be eligible for certain antivirals. I understand that uh, one of the clinical trials underway is now in discussions with those with Parkinson's uh, to gather that clinical data. So that, that, that ongoing uh, evolution of the antivirals and the eligibility is, 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 is a process, as I say, that's ongoing. In terms of, of, of prophylaxis, um, I think Jackie Bailey will be aware, but I'm happy to, to give her more detail uh, in, in writing, uh, that there's a particular uh, prophylaxis, uh, Evershield, which is uh, of interest to, to, to many people, and it has got a conditional uh, MHRA uh, a, a, a regulatory, uh, a conditional marketing authorisation. Uh, but, of course, that authorisation was given uh, before the prophylaxis, before uh, Evershield was tested against Omicron, and therefore there is insufficient data uh, to, to, to give us uh, any, uh, uh, to give us any uh, evidence, uh, credible evidence, uh, that Evershield is effective against the Omicron uh, variant. Uh, I understand that the UK Department of Health and Social Care have offered to explore the possibility of a clinical trial uh, for Evershield. I'm very supportive of that uh, and will make it very clear when I meet with the UK uh, Health Secretary, um, the Secretary of State for Health, that I would be, expect that Scottish patients would also take part uh, in those clinical trials. Emma Harper to be followed by Tess White. As a nurse, I too would like to encourage all those who are eligible to take up their vaccine offer. Many of those eligible for vaccines will face accessibility requirements, particularly those who are housebound. Accessibility should never be an obstacle for people receiving health care. With this in mind, what arrangements have been considered in the rollout of the next round of vaccinations, especially for those with accessibility needs? Cabinet Secretary. So again, this is um, uh, an issue that has been uh, well rehearsed in previous iterations of the vaccination programme, but it's absolutely right that Emma Harper uh, of course, raises it, and there may be people who are now housebound who are not housebound in previous iterations of the programme. And for them, I want to give an absolute assurance uh, that, uh, that, that they uh, have not just been thought of uh, but, but, but in this programme, but given real priority uh, when it comes to the vaccination programme. So, uh, housebound patients will be offered both flu and COVID vaccinations within their homes uh, at the same appo appointment where appropriate. Uh, those who are, are eligible will be contacted by their local board, people who are housebound who have not been contacted, much like uh, anybody else who, who feels they should be eligible, as Dr Gohani asked me, um, but, but haven't been contacted, uh, they should call the, the National Helpline uh, and, and uh, that, that the number for that is 0800 030 8013. Tess White to be followed by Fiona Hislop. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, the deployment plan highlights that Many health boards are using the Scottish Ambulance Service to reach deprived or rural communities. We know that the Scottish Ambulance Service is already under pressure. How will this be adequately resourced to ensure that these communities are not overlooked? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I pay tribute to the work that the Scottish Ambulance Service have done? Again, I think many members here have visited their mobile units uh, up and down the country. Uh, some of those mobile units, uh, Tess White is right, have been in remote rural areas. Some of them have actually been uh, in urban areas uh, as well. But they've been uh, a great asset to us uh, in this vaccination programme. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, the, 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 the 
winter uh, planning. Uh, the, program, the planning for the winter vaccination programme has been done very much in uh, hand in glove uh, with the Scottish Ambulance uh, Service. Uh, what I would say to Tess White is that uh, in remote rural uh, parts and, 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 and island communities in Scotland, uh, there is still uh, largely a reliance on those local, hyper-local uh, vaccination centres. And I think I said in my statement that there's around about 440 vaccination centres. Uh, that will hopefully give some level of confidence to Tess White uh, that, remote, that remote rural and island coverage uh, is very good indeed uh, in terms of the, the, the vaccination centres, let alone the additional uh, complementary um, uh, uh, assistance that the Scottish Ambulance Service can provide through the mobile units. Fiona Hislop to be followed by Paul O'Kane. The Cabinet Secretary may be aware that West Lothian has a bigger population than the city of Dundee and that my constituency of Linlithgow, the most constituents in Scotland with a significantly disproportionate number of over 50s residing in it. The Pyramids facility in Bathgate provides the space for the very welcome over a third of a million COVID vaccinations and like other mass vaccination centres are now understandably closed. What assurances can the Cabinet Secretary give me that staffing levels and venues, um, if they are to be based in GP surgeries in my constituency and across the country, will have the capacity and support that they need to ensure demands from the large numbers of people who will be eligible to have their winter uh, COVID booster will be met? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I agree with uh, everything Fiona uh, Hislop uh, has just said, and, and, and for various different reasons, those uh, large mass vaccination centres uh, are no longer available to us. Uh, they're being used for their original purposes. Uh, some may have closed down, but there are still large centres in some parts uh, of, of, of the country. But uh, I'm, I'm very assured by the plans I've seen by local health boards up and down the country, uh, by using those local sites, uh, but, but high in volume, to hopefully provide that reach right across uh, the country. In terms of staffing, uh, Fiona Hislop is absolutely right. Uh, the very constrained timetable that uh, JCVI are asking us to work under uh, means that we're going to have to hit a run rate every single week that is near the record run rate that we hit last year. Last year, we had that kind of boosted by the bells uh, campaign, if members uh, remember correctly. That's on top of the usual winter pressures we may well face. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, therefore, uh, you know, if there is uh, another wave of COVID, for example, uh, that will undoubtedly have an impact on staffing. So these things are being monitored. Contingency plans are absolutely being put in place. Uh, but it's fair to say this is a really ambitious programme uh, and the impact on staffing uh, and, and, and the pressures on staffing uh, are, are, are significant here. Uh, but we all know the importance of the vaccination programme and that's why I'm so grateful for every single member of that vaccination programme that is helping uh, us with this winter programme. Paul O'Kane to be followed by Gillian Martin. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I know what the Cabinet Secretary has said in terms of vaccination services being as local as possible, but we know that rhetoric doesn't always match reality. Um, there have been numerous examples of NHS Highland patients being made to make 100 mile round trips. And in Verclyde, there have been numerous examples of people with respiratory illness being instructed to travel to Glasgow. I think it's also critical in terms of delivery to recognise the RCN are balloting for strike action, with more than 90% of nurses having rejected the Scottish Government's pay offer. So what specific actions are being undertaken to ensure that vaccination centres will be as close to people as possible? And what action, further action is the Scottish Government taking to resolve the pay dispute, ensure that nurses are paid a fair wage, including those who provide uh, vital vaccination rules? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so on both those questions, I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied that the number of venues that we have uh, is, is sufficient for uh, the ambitions of the winter vaccination program. Um, if, for example, there's a need for more vaccination centres, I would expect local health boards uh, to adjust their program accordingly. He mentioned Highland uh, alone. Highland has 121 vaccination centres, so I hope that gives some level of assurance to, to, to Paul O'Kane about their coverage. In terms of the second part of his question, uh, we are in regular dialogue uh, with the trade unions. I, I want to see a fair settlement. I understand uh, why they are asking, uh, in the RCN's example, uh, for an above inflation uh, increase. Uh, but of course, uh, as John Swinney has uh, uh, said in the last couple of days uh, and, and spoken to this chamber, uh, our public finances are constrained. But nonetheless, nonetheless, while I'm disappointed that 5% has been rejected, I completely respect the mandate that trade unions have been given. And therefore, we're getting back around the table uh, with them to get to hopefully a fair deal for our NHS staff up and down this country. Julian Martin to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. 
the refugees in the uh, last few years, most recently those fleeing from the war in Ukraine. What steps are going to be taken to ensure that all refugees who may not be registered with a GP can be made aware of the vaccine programme and access appointments? Cabinet that is a really important point raised by, by Gillian Martin. So that has been part of our winter planning uh, for this particular vaccination uh, programme. Materials have been translated into Ukrainian and into Russian. Uh, of course, uh, we know where a number of the, we know where those Ukrainian refugees uh, are, um, and therefore there is a targeted effort uh, to ensure that the, uh, the material gets to them. Uh, directly. They don't have to be registered uh, to a GP, of course, to get the vaccination. Um, and so we will continue with those efforts. Uh, we're also talking to a number of community and third sector organisations to assist us with that communication. Um, and so there's good working going on. I have said to those health board uh, areas uh, that are uh, hosting uh, Ukrainian refugees, which is almost, uh, which is a significant uh, proportion of our, our local authorities, uh, I, I want us to, uh, to work with our health boards to be as proactive in this endeavour as we possibly can be. Now it's Cole Hamilton to be followed by John Mason. Uh, vaccine hesitancy will be as big an issue in this rollout as it has been in previous rollouts, um, particularly so given that people believe that we are now living around COVID, it is just a way of life. What uh, additional messages can the government give to those people who are sceptical about the efficacy of vaccines um, and how important it is to take up this new booster jab? Cabinet Secretary. School Hamilton is, is absolutely right. It's been one of the concerns I've had that uh, uh, as COVID is perhaps not as prominent on the agenda uh, as, as it perhaps was in, in previous iterations of the programme. I don't want there to be any complacency setting in. Now, the indications thus far from the portal that has been opened for health and social care workers and from the uh, work that's been done in care homes, it doesn't suggest that the uptake uh, has been affected, but we'll not be complacent about that. We all have responsibility, primarily myself, of course, in the role that I occupy, but I think we all have responsibility to continue uh, to, to communicate uh, the benefits of the vaccine. So I would urge everybody to do that. I certainly will do that in my position. Uh, and, and it's not just about vaccine hesitancy. We know there are certain groups within the population where the uptake has been lower. And that's where, going back to Tess White's point, and that's where our, our mobile units can be really effective if they're uh, outside particular community facilities, uh, outside of, uh, we know they've been deployed previously in the Gudwara, uh, in the mosques, in areas of high deprivation, uh, and they've been a fantastic resource in that sense. So if I can give uh, Alice Cole Hamilton an absolute reassurance that nobody in the government is being complacent, and I would urge everybody here to communicate the benefits uh, of taking up the vaccine. John Mason to be followed by Julian Mackay. Hey, thank you very much. We were told previously at the COVID committee that worldwide some 20 million lives have been saved by the vaccines. Uh, and yet there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation on social media. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that 20 million is, is roughly the figure of lives that have been saved? And can he reassure those that are made nervous by social media? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, he, he's referring to, to a study by uh, Imperial College uh, London. He's right, the, 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 the number of lives saved is uh, just below 20 million, 19.8 million. Uh, we know, of course, as I referenced, I think, in my comments, uh, that Scotland, Scotland alone, uh, 28,000 lives uh, have been saved uh, by the vaccine. There is a lot of disinformation. We're doing our best to, to counter that disinformation uh, you know, by, by, by uh, promoting the benefits of the vaccine on social media platforms uh, that, that, that can reach a far wider uh, audience than perhaps, as I say this with no disrespect, uh, perhaps are, than, than, than are watching uh, our proceedings here uh, in the chamber. So we'll continue with that effort to counter disinformation. And as I said to Alex Cole Hamilton, I think uh, not just do I have a responsibility in that, I think we all have a responsibility uh, in that. Julian Mackay to be followed by Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the update from the Cabinet Secretary. We are in a cost of living crisis and I'm sure that the Cabinet Secretary would not want anyone to not be able to make their appointment due to not being able to afford to get there. Has the Scottish Government had any conversations with health boards about what support may be offered in these circumstances? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, again, we have uh, told uh, health boards, uh, and they have uh, been very uh, willing to do this, of course, that uh, we, have to, uh, we have to factor the cost of living crisis into our planning. Uh, the cost of living crisis is a public health crisis. Uh, we know that. Uh, and therefore, that planning is well underway. Uh, if people do not feel they can uh, leave the house because they cannot afford uh, to do so, uh, then of course they should contact the National Vaccine, uh, Vaccination Helpline. They can uh, contact the local health board. And my expectation, absolute expectation, uh, would be, but I will further reiterate this to our health board colleagues, is that we would do everything in our power to get to those people or indeed get those people uh, to us 
uh, at no cost uh, to themselves uh, if, of course, uh, the cost of travelling to a vaccination centre uh, is indeed prohibitive. Edward Mountain to be followed by Colin Beatty. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, uh, Secretary centralised vaccination centres simply don't work in rural areas. One husband and vulnerable elderly couple in Straths Bay <clears throat> have been given their appointments on two different days in two different locations, with one being asked to make an eight-hour round trip of 70 miles to Inverness. That doesn't fit in with your statement to provide more local centres. I favour GPs in rural areas rolling out vaccines as they did earlier in the pandemic. If GPs are willing to do this, are you willing to support them? Cabinet Secretary. In, in short, yes, uh, ab absolutely. Uh, what I would say to uh, Mr Mountain is if he wants to furnish me with those specific details, I'm happy to follow that up with the appropriate health boards. I gave the details of the local uh, arrangements and how many local centres there are. If there's been an issue with scheduling, that's of course regrettable. Uh, yes, uh, my, my, my colleague um, Fergus Ewing uh, and I had a meeting with a local uh, GP and, and, and uh, of course if local GPs in, for example, North Highland uh, are, are keen uh, to be part of that vaccine uh, programme uh, and they are needed, if that is the case, if they are needed, uh, then there should be no uh, restriction on behalf of government. For example, we know uh, GPs uh, have been used. In fact, I visited a GP in the island of Rothsey, uh, the island of Butte in, in Rothsey, uh, uh, who were administering uh, vaccinations. Um, so uh, th there's not a, a legal restriction uh, in that sense if GPs are willing to do so. We know it's not part of the contract, but if they're willing to do so. But on his specific point around his constituents, I'm happy uh, to delve further uh, if he's able to provide the details. And Colin Beattie. Clearly, we want vaccination centres to be as accessible as possible and to minimise, again, as far as possible, lengthy travel to get vaccination, especially for people who are reliant on public transport. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise if the number of venues for vaccination will be kept under review? Cabinet Secretary. Sure, it absolutely will be kept under review. Um, and, and I would expect uh, if there is a need to uh, adjust, then health boards would adjust accordingly. Uh, so, so, so they will absolutely do that. And I've seen uh, that happen in previous iterations uh, of the vaccination uh, effort. Um, and, and, and I would just make the point that I made to Gillian Mackay. Uh, if anybody is concerned about the cost of travel uh, or their ability to travel and arranging transport to and from vaccination appointments, uh, for, 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 for example, mobility issues or indeed other issues. Uh, there, there is support available uh, uh, from each board. You can go to the NHS Inform website for the details of that. You can also call uh, your local health board, uh, vaccination helpline, or indeed uh, the national helpline who can direct you to the right place as well, because we want nobody, uh, we want no barriers to anybody uh, coming forward uh, for the vaccination. Uh, and again, I would urge anybody who's eligible to please come forward to protect yourself, uh, but also to protect others, and of course to protect our NHS too. Thank you. That concludes the ministerial statement. The next item of business is consideration of two parliamentary bureau motions, and I ask George Adam, on behalf of the parliamentary bureau, to move motions 5910 on committee membership and 5916 on committee substitute. Thank you and moved, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. The questions on these motions will be put at decision time, and there is one question to be put as a result of today's business, and I propose to ask a single question on two parliamentary bureau motions. Does any member object? The question, therefore, is that motions 5910 on committee membership and 5916 on committee substitute be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The motions are therefore agreed. That concludes decision time. Um, before I close this meeting, I do appreciate that members are deeply concerned about the health of Her Majesty, and I would advise members that Parliament will ensure that members are informed of any news that we may have to share with you regards um, business over the coming days. Thank you. And I close this meeting.